Hi. Flashlight. Welcome, everybody. Flashlight. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I can manage with God's help. Welcome to our class. We're trying to get ready for the Day of Atonement, which is Tuesday night for Wednesday. Uh, so we welcome everyone. Very good. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we hope to be of help. Um, I'll just wait another minute or so. Rabbi Yaakov, are you on yet? I know he's calling How's right that in. Yeah. Do you have more yeah. wine? Oh, that's actually very good. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. Okay. If you give me a maximum, if there's any way to raise it even more, it would be fine. Yeah. Okay. We're just about ready with everybody. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is to talk about Tuesday, which is kind of a complicated day. We had spent some time on it already, uh, Erev Yom Kippur. And the way we enter Yom Kippur, uh, the Day of Atonement, is very, very important because even before the sealing process for the year begins, that we have already shown the Almighty in many different ways that we love him, and that he loves us, and he wants us to be prepared so that we will have the greatest, greatest blessing for the coming years. It's for very beautiful reasons and beautiful, wonderful things that we do the different things. We already discussed uh, what is called the Kaporos uh, ceremony, which is done on Arab Yom Kippur. If it can be done with an actual chicken, would be preferable. If not, one could take the 18 cents mm -hmm. and do that ceremony. And that ceremony, which is a master, and it's even in many of the, the prayer books, mm -hmm. it uh, expresses the fact that we're aware that we are under judgment with God's mercy, and that we take either the charity or the chicken and indicate to the Almighty <clears throat> really which is, is happening to the chicken or even the money should be happening to us in which we swing it around our heads, realizing how fragile we really are. This is the mistake of the human being very often. We think we're here to stay. We think we're permanent. We think we can uh, go through anything, etc. You notice these frightful hurricanes and these incredible flash floods, enormous amounts of rain and all kinds of catastrophes around the world. If you've been following the news over the months, it's not just this week or the last couple of weeks, that the Almighty is really showing the real brilliant scientists and brilliant climate control people and all those who think that everything is completely under our hands, God is showing us you're completely wrong. So this in itself, <laughs> let's take it the right way that the Almighty is showing us he created this world, he, he maintains it in creation, and he is the one who is running it right now as well. And our lives are very, very fragile, very, very fragile, very delicate, and we... Uh, asking for his mercy, especially on Tuesday, all week, but especially on Tuesday. So the reason behind that Kapara ceremony is it puts us in the proper frame of mind. And uh, I could spend the whole class just on that, but I want to cover some other things as well. Okay, um, the money, if it is used for the ceremony, is of course placed in charity. Charity is a very powerful tool. We have a verse in the Torah that teaches us, Tzedakah Tatzel Mimavis. Charity saves, even God forbid, from the opposite of life. Charity saves. It's a very powerful thing. We take of our money, which we could enjoy ourselves, and we devote it to someone who is less better off than we, someone who needs it more than we do. And by doing so, the Almighty says, I'm doing charity all the time. He's keeping this world in existence despite all the chaos. He's feeding us and taking care of us. Follow the Almighty's example. Help somebody who is in need, somebody less fortunate than yourself. You don't have to look far. <laughs> you don't have to look far today to find someone like that. All right. In the Tuesday morning services, I'm just going to go through some of the features of Tuesday every Yom Kippur that in the prayers, we omit the Thanksgiving offering, Mizmo Lesota, this is after Hodu. You would perhaps wonder why should the Thanksgiving paragraph uh, be omitted on the day before Yom Kippur? And the reason for that is because 
Tuesday night, we will be fasting. When that offering, the Thanksgiving offering, will be brought, and that's why that paragraph, Ms. Mula Soda, is said in the davening that represents the Thanksgiving offering. And since we can't, can't eat, it's supposed to be eaten for the day that it's offered and the night afterwards. And since we can't eat it on Yom Kippur, therefore it is omitted. Also, we don't say Tachna on that day. It's like holiday itself. Tuesday is like holiday itself. You can do work, of course, uh, and you can uh, ride. You can uh, do the normal uh, weekday activities, but it's like a holiday. We don't recite the Tachna prayers yet which is asking for forgiveness and admitting our sins. That will be done in the afternoon, but not for chakras, not in the morning. The Ovina Malkinu is also omitted from the morning. And one of the beautiful customs is, if you can do this, I think Rabbi Yaakov Bornstein also had mentioned doing this before Rosh Hashanah, especially on the day before Yom Kippur. What we do is we ask for, if you can, Lekach, we ask for a peace of uh, either honey cake or some sweet cake uh, from someone else, and we eat that. And there's a reason for that custom, a very interesting reason for that custom, especially on Arab Yom Kippur. And the reason for that is that in case this coming year it was decreed that we have to come on to someone else for help, that this simple request, as, as you know, I mentioned very recently, we want to enter Yom Kippur in such a way that we have the very, very, very best blessings. In case, God forbid, a person is a decree that they are going to have to come on to the help of others, this should do it. <laughs> this should cover it. This should cover it by asking for a nice piece of cake. If honey cake is available, that would be best. And, um, and we eat it. And we wish each other a wonderful, sweet, happy, healthy New Year. Um, another thing that we have mentioned already, um, and these things is good to repeat them because there's so many details. We're supposed to eat and drink more than we normally would on Tuesday. It says to even try to eat two days worth. That might be tough for some of us, but we certainly can eat very healthy foods that will sustain us for the two days. God is so merciful, he wants to forgive us. He's told us to fast, not to hurt us. He's told us not to wear leather shoes, which are comfortable. You can wear rubber or cloth shoes. Uh, he's told us not to wash ourselves for pleasure, only for sanitary. If you had to go to the bathroom, for instance, but even there, very, very limited. When we wash our hands in the morning as we get up, remember Nicholas, we've spoken about that, learned classes on that. We only wash up to the ends of the fingers. That's up to the knuckles, we call it. Up to the ends of the fingers. Even though the, this washing is not for pleasure at all, it's to remove uh, the uncleanliness from the night before. Even there, everything bare, bare men, and not, not washing, and not wearing uh, the leather shoes, not eating and drinking, of course. We Also, we don't put ointments. Oint, I'm sorry, I said it wrong not ointments, but ointments upon ourselves and perfumes and things like that, uh, we don't put on. And the marital relationship is not practiced on Yom Kippur as well. So altogether, there's five things. They're called five inuyim, five limitations or five restrictions in which we give up. I think this expression is right. I hope I'm using it properly. We're giving up our creature com 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 I'm sorry, creature comforts. That's what I'm trying to say. Creature comforts. Uh, comforts. These are the things that we normally enjoy. Human beings enjoy them and make it a pleasure for, for all. So it becomes a really a spiritual day. Yom Kippur is an angelic spiritual day. Get off of the regular earthly merry-go-round for a day and devote ourselves entirely a day of prayer, a day of being close to the Almighty. And we get a wonderful thing from this. First of all, the wonderful goodness God has already, he's already set aside for us a wonderful year. A wonderful year. But we have to bring it down here on earth. That's what he wants us to do during these 10 days of repentance and especially on Yom Kippur. So we do our best to observe these laws as much as we can. 
once again, get off of the earthly merry-go-round of things we normally enjoy, <laughs> especially eating and drinking, right? Eating and drinking, washing, taking a shower, things of this nature, etc. cetera. Uh, as I mentioned, the comfort of leather shoes, which are usually much more comfortable than many of the other shoes. Everything is synthetic today. You can wear sneakers. If you look at what your shoes are made out of, today it is very rare to have real <laughs> real authentic leather shoes if you, your shoes are made out of man-made materials as they often say uh, that's something you can use if they're rubber sneakers cloth some are made out of cloth slippers etc all these things are okay uh, but not just the, the comfort of leather shoes okay um now that we took care of chakras we omit them as well as sort of prayer we omit the Tachnan prayers in which we confess our sins until later. The Ovino Malkina we've been saying all week is also omitted in the morning. Uh, I don't know how many of you know what Kreplach are. It's, a, it's sort of a fleshic type of blintz as a customary in Chabad to eat that on Erev Yom Kippur. Eating enough for two days don't, doesn't mean don't stuff yourself ridiculously and, and make God forbid to be opposite. It is very important to drink periodically throughout the day. If you try to bloat yourself five minutes before the fast begins, it will be beginning at candle lighting time uh, approximately. Uh, that be very careful to drink in the course of the day. In fact, the days, uh, even from today, get in the habit of already make sure that you're well hydrated uh, so that you'll be okay for Free Yom Kippur morning. For some reason, because it was hot, humid weather, I remember in Baltimore last year, I woke up so totally parched, so completely parched, I was beginning to wonder if I could even make it through Yom Kippur. But the Almighty helped, thank God he helped, and I felt better as the day progressed, actually. And I actually felt even more hydrated. Obviously, I did not drink anything, did not, did not drink anything of any sort. But uh, the Almighty has his ways of, of, of helping. Okay, um, this is also uh, important. We have what we call a pseudosum of secus, a meal which separates uh, before uh, the fast begins to, and I'll get to that uh, in just a moment. Uh, there's something else I want to speak about. There's a custom, this is the men are more familiar with this perhaps, in which someone takes a leather strap, and we do sort of a pretend of whipping. I said pretend. You don't whack the person. Is it? But, uh, this is a reminder that when we transgress what the Almighty has told us to do, when we have the Holy Temple, that if somebody was really, really obstinate and insisted on doing major sins in the Torah, that they would get uh, lashes. So this is just a, a light tap with the strap. Uh, this should be done Yom Kippur afternoon as well. And there's one other thing I want to mention, too. It's called going to the mikvah on Erev Yom Kippur. This actually is not just, we think of going to the mikvah as the main thing that a Jewish woman does at different times, you know, once a month or so. This is for everybody, and there's two reasons behind it. One reason when we go to the mikvah is purification. We want to enter the holiest day of the year in a state of purity. So that would make good sense to go to the mikvah if we can. Another reason you may find surprising is gerus. A ger is a convert. We are like converts on the day before Yom Kippur, in which we will immerse ourselves and purify ourselves. It's sort of like a new lease on life. A new lease on life. So there's these two reasons for uh, going to the mikvah on Erev Yom Kippur. Well, for many people, that's awkward or difficult or whatever. There actually is something else that can be done. You may never have heard of this before, but it has been uh, published for quite some time. If you can't go to the mikvah, I'm sure you're going to take a shower, right? You're going to take a shower before Yom Kippur to clean yourself. If you have the shower run on yourself before you use the soap and shampoo, just let the shower run on your body. Now, many people don't know this, but we can all do it because we're all going to take a shower at least, right? Before you can keep, if you can't go to the mikvah, run the shower for three minutes upon your body 
And then you could do your usual soaping and shampooing and so that that you normally would do. But first let the water run on the body. This is drawn water, but when that quantity of water, three minutes, take three minutes of letting the shower run on you, you know, full blast, full blast. Uh, you know, what you would call comfortable temperature. It doesn't be, have to be hot or cold. Comfortable temperature that you can also fulfill this. So this is, a, I don't have a choice. I, if you think I'm telling you, <laughs> do as he says, but not as he does. I'm telling you to do what I does as well as what he says. Because here, I think the closest make was three and a half uh, hours drive away. It's not exactly something I could do on Arab Yom Kippur. So I'm also going to have to take the same advice that I'm giving you, but stressing it to you. Three minutes under the water before you do your soap and your shampoo. Just let yourself get completely wet, which you normally would anyway. But take a few minutes there. Try to be sure for like three minutes of just the water on your body before you soap and shampoo. And then you can proceed as you normally would uh, with any shower. So this is all uh, for the purpose of helping us all enter the Day of Atonement already, already um, purified as best as we can. And then we do our best and the Almighty does the rest. Okay, um, let's look at a few more things now. So we mentioned the tapping with the leather strap. If that sounds strange or something you've never done before, please go to the rabbi of your synagogue or to the rabbi of a synagogue. At best, you go to the rabbi of your synagogue, and there will be congregants there. There will be people there um, that will help you with that. So mikvah and the tapping with the strap on the back, that should be before the mincha prayer is done. Now I'm coming to the mincha prayer. <laughs> if you have a master, if you have uh, that would be ideal, actually, if you have a master. Um, in the Mincha prayer of Erev Yom Kippur, we do, we do the al We do the confession of sins. Confession of sins, this is between you and the Almighty. And don't confuse us with any of these Christian ideas that they have come up. Then you tell, you tell the, the, the Galach there where all the wrong things you did and, 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 and he, uh, absor ab uh, he absolves you of any wrongdoing, whatever. We only confess to the Almighty. He wants us to do that. It's part of the uh, atonement process. It's part of the tshuva repentance process is to state with our mouth. Nobody has to hear it. You can do it quietly. Nobody has to hear it. We state with our mouth uh, things that we have done. So the al is a general confession. That's what I want to point out. If there's certain things that we have done wrong, we should mention them. You can say it in English when you get to that particular point. Uh, so I'm going to tell you where it is. In the um, era of Yom Kippur service, it will start, of course, with Ashrei. It will follow with the Shemona Esri, with all the changes. We've been making these changes for 10 days now. Zechrein L'chaim, Yechemocha, Melcha Kadosh, and then Tvazinu Chesom L'chaim Tzom, Vsev L'chaim, Oseh HaShalom. We continue with those changes that we've been making for the 10 days already. And then, before you finish the Shemona Esri, then we have Ashamnu Boganu and the Al Khaits, which is the confession. Remember, this is part is between you and God, no human beings involved at all. They took all kinds of things from us and they distorted them and made up all kinds of fairy tales and things like that that the um <laughs> That, that the Reverend calls them Bubba Mices. Some, some stories from your grandmother are very education believing. They're not all fantasies, etc. But at any rate, before one finishes the Shemon Esri, be very careful. Use the Matzah. We'll have the Mincha for Yom Kippur. I'm sorry, Mincha for Erev Yom Kippur, as well as all the Yom Kippur prayers. Towards the end, right before you have Elokai Mitzur, is Yehul Ratzon after Baruch Hashem Hamvarach Hashem Moishvil Ba Sholom, 
Then we have uh, we have the Vidui, and then you have the full set of the al -Khaits. What's the big rush? I'll be going to recite that on uh, Yom Kippur itself. We recite it many times, starting from Tuesday night, and then Wednesday morning, and in the Musa prayer, and in the Mecha prayer, etc. And there's Ne'ilah, there's that extra prayer we also have on Yom Kippur. We're going to be doing the confession over and over and over again. Why? Because each time we say it, the Almighty cleanses us on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is a powerful day, a very powerful day, that with repentance and correction of our wrong deeds, improvement, Yom Kippur is a huge eraser. It erases that blackboard. Uh, now it's a chalkboard. I, I don't know what they call it now. It erases all those things that we should not have done, not thought, not said, not have done. It said it erases all of them. You start with a clean slate. So just in case, God forbid, someone did something wrong, and God forbid I say they did something wrong between one confession of Yom Kippur to the next, then um, therefore it can be erased with, once again, proper repentance. If I mention that the first two days of the year, Rosh Hashanah, are so critical for every thought and speech and deed, you can imagine how critical it is to be careful on Yom Kippur. So what's the big rush to do this confession before before the evening in which Kol Nidre, before Yom Kippur even starts? So the reason is, in case something goes wrong, God forbid, and someone becomes ill or they became, uh, years ago, people would drink wine also. They might become intoxicated. In case someone cannot enter Yom Kippur, first thing, with the confession of the sins, which is cleansing. Again, the confessions between ourselves and God. No human being. No, no, nothing. No intermediaries. We only pray to God. We ask God for forgiveness and no one else. In case something should go wrong on Tuesday night, God forbid, God forbid, God forbid, the person has already entered Yom Kippur after already having recited the confession of sins in the Mecha prayer prior to Yom Kippur itself. I want us to look a little bit at the al uh, If you look at Hashem and Bagan, we, were, uh, we have been guilty, we have uh, been uh, treacherous, etc. Um, I want us to look a little bit at the al -Khaits. And I have to tell people um, that those individual things that a person has done don't depend on the Al-Khaits to cover them. Why not? What's it there for? These things are general. The Al-Khaits, as we have in the Master, they're general, and they help remind us of things that we have done wrong. Now, this includes things we did even as a child. Maybe we hit our parent, but we never asked God's forgiveness. Maybe we were disrespectful to our parent. Maybe we, we were disrespectful after we became bar mitzvah and bas mitzvah too. Uh, boys 13 years of age and girls 12 years of age. Maybe we were chutzpahed, we were disrespectful to them. And we, for some reason or other, it got uh, swept under the rug like many of our sins. And uh, we've never really, really asked forgiveness uh, for it. And there's no question that if there's someone that you know that you had difficulty with during the year, I'm putting it in a nice way, aren't I? You were at odds with that person, maybe you insulted them, or they insulted you, whatever. The biggest guarantee for life is if you have enough courage and enough self-control to say, I was wrong too. Speak to that person before Yom Kippur and ask for their forgiveness. And not to be shy about it, not to delay it. It's best if it's all done before Yom Kippur and certainly on Yom Kippur, but best before Yom Kippur. Now, I'm going to go through a couple of al -Khaids. I'm going to point out my, 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 what I was trying to say as well. I do hope uh, to get some of the, the mimer. It so happens. I see we got time. Good, thank God. The mimer that we have been studying from the previous Rebbe is actually perfectly suitable to this 
uh, week, as a matter of fact, in preparation for Yom Kippur too. Let's take a, a little bit look at the al hates for instance. al hate for the sin, Shekhar Tunnel of Fenecha, and we bang our chest. You know, you don't, you don't have to slam yourself. It's symbolic that we're saying, why do we um, take our fist and, and knock it on the, on the left side? That's where the heart is, like saying, you, my heart, you, my heart, you, use, <laughs> you deserve a, a slap. Well, maybe that's how I should put it. You, my heart, you deserve a slap because I listen to you to do, God forbid, the wrong thing. Think the wrong thing, say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. Um, one should know that even wrong thoughts, when one harbors wrong thoughts of any kind, maybe it's something that's immodest or immoral, maybe it's anger at another person, or jealousy, or selfishness, or God forbid, revenge, just in the thought, what did I do? I didn't say anything. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. Yes, you did. The thoughts themselves are very destructive and very often worse, actually, than the actual action. Um, and that's, I guess, a topic for another time. Let me show you why the al-hates are insufficient. You must add your own. We must add our own things that we know that we did wrong and ask God's forgiveness. Here's a couple of them. Al-hate for the sin, shekhat, that we sin before you, but onus uvarotsum. Some things we did, we were forced into it and other things we did willingly. So that deserves some uh, consideration here just for a few minutes. Things that we knew were wrong, and we decided to do it anyway, God forbid, or let's say we couldn't overcome our temptation and we did it anyway. I understand why I have to ask forgiveness for that. Why should we have to ask forgiveness from God if it's something that wasn't under our control. I'll give you one simple example. Let's say you walked into the bathroom on Shabbos, and the habit is you flip the switch. Unfortunately, in Shabbos, we don't turn our on lights or off. <clears throat> it's Shabbos. All right, that in itself is, is very good, and the person regrets it immediately. Why on Yom Kippur should we have to ask forgiveness for something that was sort of out of our control, it was done by half, but it was a habit, you'll find the answer very interesting. If we're really careful all the time not to do the wrong thing, be it Shabbos, not to violate Shabbos, be it not to say something disrespectful or wrong to, or uh, evil talk or evil thoughts, etc. If we're really careful with what we eat, as well as what we say, not only what comes out of the mouth, what comes into the mouth, what comes out of the mouth. If we're really consistently careful, very, very careful about what we do when we are in control, then the Almighty goes out of his way to catch us and stop us before they do the wrong thing. Person going into the bathroom, they're half asleep. Might be in the middle of Friday night, too. They have to and they start lifting the hand. Ooh, it's Shabbos! Now, how did that happen? The person was half asleep. Because they're very, very careful. Normally, not to turn on any lights or turn them off on a Shabbos. They're very, very careful. The Almighty helps them, catches them, catches them before they do the wrong thing. So that's just one of the examples of that. Uh, once again, if a person did turn on the light on Shabbos, even though they didn't mean to, that's why we ask God's forgiveness anyway, because if we're really, really, really careful all the time, not just with Shabbos, but with all the commandments as best as we can, we do things very, very carefully, really deliberately. Uh, Robinson speaks about this all the time, etc. discernment, being really, really careful about what we do. Then the Almighty catches us uh, and stops us. I think I told you this story um, I'm going to review, even if you've heard it before, uh, it's helpful. I was taught from my childhood on never put your back to the Torah. Never, never put your back to the Torah. It was very holy. Just from a little, little kid, I was taught that consistently. I was always very careful about it. Okay. Many, many years later, I was teaching in uh, the Lubavitch Yeshiva, Chabad Yeshiva in Boston, Massachusetts. I had grown up. I went to the school myself, and then I grew up. I was teaching there myself, and we had services for the 
uh, students. The students were by mitzvah, made a minion for them. And uh, we were reading the Torah one day. And there also, I was careful, you know, not to put my back to the Torah as I always am and everything. Okay. So the Torah was read, and the young fellow, young boy who picked it up, sat down with it. And he sat down with it on the side of the chapel, where no one's near me. Well, later on, I got this creepy, creepy feeling. Boo! I couldn't figure out why. So I looked around me. What, what's going on? Why do I have this creepy feeling? The young boy who was holding the Torah changed his position. Where does he go? Right in back of me. <laughs> so I'm trying to bring out to you, if we're careful all the time to keep the commandments, be careful all the time to show great respect for the Torah, God helps us not even violate by accident. Even by accident, where it's completely unplanned, the Almighty sees to it that we don't do the wrong thing. So that, I hope, is a clear illustration of that as well. So now we see where we're asking God for forgiveness, not only for what we did intentionally, we knew what we are doing, but even things that were out of our control. It's a lesson, a reminder that we have to be careful as much as we can all the time. All right. Here's an okay. I'm just picking a few of them at a time. For the sin that we sin before you, with the expression of the lips. Everything we said this year, was it the proper thing? Some people, you know, we live also in uh, a time where people use very foul language. And even on the, the, the television or the, uh, the videos, or the radio, foul language, unbelievable, it's sickening, foul language is used. That's also forbidden by the Torah. But I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't call somebody one a dirty name or anything. I just said it. It's called nivel pe. What is that? What is our mouth created for? Our teeth, our tongues, my wonderful Zadie, my grandfather, tell me this lesson. Your mouth, your teeth, your tongue, your palate. They are not just created for you to chew food. An animal does that too. The cow does that too. Are you mm -hmm. a cow? No. Mm -hmm. They are created to praise God and to say his holy name, the way we're allowed to pronounce it, say prayers, use it for Torah study, say words of kindness, say words that are at least power of, you know, if you know what I mean, power of. They might not be always holy words, but at least they're not unholy words, etc., etc. Be choice for son. It's one of the alchemists. So God has given us this opportunity. As I say, the alchemists are not complete in themselves. You know yourself, you did a specific thing wrong. Don't just look for an alchemist that covers. No, don't do that. Add it in. You can say it in English, say it in French, in Greek, whatever, whatever language, Yiddish, whatever language you want to do. And but this is the time to specify what one has done wrong. Not out loud. You don't have to announce it. You say it quietly to yourself. You're speaking between yourself and the Almighty uh, as well. Uh, here's a, a real good one. <laughs> uh, concerning the sin that we seen before you, that's with denial and with outright deception or lying. <laughs> So this is also something that has to do with the mouth. I'm afraid this time she said, I didn't do it. No, no, no. Or no, it wasn't me, whatever. We denied something that we were responsible for. Or we fooled people. We directed people out of our direction because we didn't want to be held uh, responsible, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things. Uh, I'm, I'm just picking a few of these uh, that I'm going to do. Uh, this one is a sad one. The sin, concerning the sin that we sinned before you, in which we desecrated God's name. Many people know that we're Jewish, even without looking at us very carefully. You can see even a Jewish man, uh, they may have a, a, a skull cap on, a scissors, a hat, whatever it may happen to be. Uh, that's easy to spot. Even a Jewish woman also, besides the fact that we get known in our neighborhoods, etc., people can see that they're dressed a certain way. Just a very modest way, they can tell that this is a Jewish woman. If we do something even a little bit out of line, 
a little bit out of line. Um, let's say, for instance, uh, you didn't, you're, you're coming out and there's someone behind you and you don't bother, you know what I said? You don't bother to hold the door for them or open the door for them. This creates what we call a chil Hashem. I thought that was a religious person. Look how impolite they are. They saw that I was there, but they didn't open the door for me or simply hold the door for me. Now, that's a teeny tiny offense, isn't it? It seems like a teeny tiny offense. It's an enormous offense. It's an enormous offense because that person says that that's how a religious person acts. That's how they behave. Even a, what we call a low life. A low life person of any faith or any uh, of any race shows the courtesy to hold the door. Now that's a teeny tiny thing, isn't it? Someone drops something, a bundle, they're having trouble with it, etc., and just simply walk by, ignoring them. When you fold saw you saw that simply offer me, I help you, etc. This creates the opposite of the desecration God of God's name. That's what Hilashem is. You can make a kiddush Hashem. You sanctify God's name. People say, what a nice person is this. Oh, they're Jewish. I see they don't believe what I believe. Uh, they, I see that they believe they're religious people. I, I understand they believe in God, etc. They're very fervent. They have, I see that they dress a certain way and that they uh, live a certain way. They only eat certain things. They, they, they don't desecrate the Sabbath. Now I see that they're a mensch. When it comes to simple courtesy, consideration of somebody else, uh, that they are there. Um, here's one that you wouldn't think is wrong at all. Uh, for the sin we sinned before, you've been a tears going, stretching out the neck. When a Jewish person walks, the code of Jewish law teaches us to look slightly down. You have to look in front of you, of course, but to look slightly down. And not to go around with your nose up in the air thinking you're better than everybody else. That's in the old hates. What's it doing there? That's so terrible. My goodness. I did lots more worse things than that. This is what we're talking about. That even what seems to be a slight thing uh, is really much more than that, too. Here's a toughie that, that I have to mention. Uh, concerning the sin that we sinned before you, but freak us all. Precus ol is really the root of all the things we do wrong. Precus ol means we throw up the yoke of the Torah. So I was talking about the yoke of the Torah or the yoke of the Almighty's kingdom. And people said, are you talking about throwing up an egg? <laughs> the yoke of an egg? People don't know what a yoke is today. Well, years ago and in some primitive, primitive countries, they will plow the field and harvest the field with oxen with animals and on the ox's neck is a wooden bar called the yoke and it's a pole going from the yoke to the plow which is a metal blade that makes a furrow in the ground so the yoke teaches the animal it's like breaking in a, a, a horse you know a, a bucking bronco it, it teaches the animal to be of use to humanity that by the animal having this wooden bar over its head. And sometimes you have two animals together uh, with this uh, double, you know, this bar for the two animals, a wooden bar, pulling the plow, pulling the wagon. This is of use to humanity. But the animal can't run wild. It can't go around um, just doing anything it feels like, taking a walk. It's under the control of the owner, the farmer, and it's directed to do the proper thing. So that's how we use the expression, the yoke, of the kingdom of heaven, uh, the yoke of the commandments, etc. That means voluntarily we take upon ourselves the understanding that we're under the Almighty and we have to guide our days and control our days appropriately to do what the Almighty wants us to do. Well, what's precus O? I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. Oh boy, that sounds really bad, doesn't it? But I'm afraid. And although I shouted with my voice, the voice inside us does that from time to time as well. I know I should, really shouldn't do this. It's wrong. And I know I could control myself. 
I could control myself. Sometimes it's something that's so tempting. Oh, 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 I gotta look at it, or I gotta taste it, or I gotta do it. I gotta have to say it. I just have to say it. Sometimes a person uh, is fighting with their temptations and with their evil desires, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Precursor is worse than that. I know it's wrong. I could control myself. I shouldn't do it. I'm going to do it anyway. That's the worst, worst uh, disrespect to the Almighty. Where is it? On Yom Kippur, right over here. So what we mustn't do is say, I never do that. Not me. That's these 10 other guys, but not me. No. We know that, yes, it is me. Time to time, I'm afraid that we come under that uh, situation. So with that, uh, and I hope that Yom Kippur will be all that much more meaningful to us. Um, maybe those who are listening can remind me. I think we have our Gemara class. There's still a half an hour. Please don't go away. But we've been changing the schedules uh, to accommodate Monday night. I think it's 8, eight o'clock at night. If this is somebody who remembers, I did write it down. Uh, but I wanted to remind everybody, I believe it's 8 o'clock Monday night that we do have uh, the Gemara class. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Is there anybody from the Gemara class still on, I hope? Anybody? Yeah, okay. I think I think we made it for 8 o'clock Monday night. It, it, does that sound right, River Frame? Am I correct? Yeah, Monday 8 to 9. 8 to 9. Very uh -huh. good. Thank you very much, Ray. It's so that it won't interfere. Eventually, we'll be able to move it, make it more earlier too, uh, once the clock changes, which is not too long from now, but it is a while. All right, please take. The only thing I'm wondering, the only thing I'm wondering is whether I don't have any idea when Paros is here in Baltimore. I have a feeling sometimes it's Monday night, like at ten o'clock. Yeah. Rabbi Baron comes. Yeah, to the yeah, theater. yeah. I used to go too. Yeah. I used to. I would, I'm not sure what Rabbi wow. Gorsh is going to do, but I know he's. Wonderful, and he does his absolute best with each of the customs and right. commandments. So, um, right, right. So I'm not exactly sure what the plan is, but at any rate, <laughs> I'll I'll be calling people if we have we could we could wind up with the same problem. But at any rate, I used to do it with Rabbi Baron as well, and very grateful that uh, for what he did to drive. He has to go and pick up the chickens and drive the truck himself and drive it back and uh, late at night. Believe me, we appreciate what he does and what he continues doing. Okay, what I'd like you to do now, we're going to work a little bit on the mime. Yes? Oh, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. Uh, let's say you're in the middle of Al Hate. Yeah. Uh, yes, the yes. Thing, and, yeah. and you're getting, and the minion moves on. Yeah. You're no longer with the minion. Do you continue with the al hate? You can continue the al hate unless it's like Kedusha. Well, what might happen is it might be Kedusha. You could say Kedusha while you're in the al hates. You could say Kedusha. Uh, this you can do. Yeah. And the reason you can do it is because after, it's a good question. After Hamavorech is Amoyesu is really the end of the Shemones, right? And then we see the Yihiyu Lerotson before Elokai Netzor. Before the very last paragraph, there. So, if the minion moves ahead of you, uh, you can uh, you can do the appropriate uh, answers for the Kaddish, etc. You'll wait on your Elena, that you'll wait on, but something like the answer Kaddish, uh, that you can do. Yeah, or Kedusha. Depend. You know, it all depends on what the situation is. That's very very good. Okay, an okay. excellent question. Yeah. Please share with everybody what the, what this document. Is powerless to do when the shofar is blown for the Yom Kippur. Well, maybe you can do that. I'm not sure specifically what you're talking about. I'm saying that. Oh, you mean at the end of Yom Kippur? That, okay, all year long, the sudden you can do monkey business. But on Yom Kippur, or in the 10 days of war, even, I think. Uh, the sun is rendered powerless with the blowing of the shofar, no? It's it's the blowing on Rosh Hashanah, actually. It's blowing on Rosh Hashanah. You want to share the that? That's that when he said, uh, yeah, but we passed Rosh Hashanah already. Um, the the blowing at the end of Yom Kippur is a reminder of the Jubilee year. Actually, that's what that's about. 
Okay. Um, when we will have the Jubilee year, actually, again, when the Mashiach comes, then the services are very similar to uh, Rosh Hashanah, by the way. Um, okay. Thank you, Robertson. Let's take a look at page 98. I have time to get some of this in, even a few minutes. 98, that's in the Mimer. And he goes on and says, yeah. We're 98 towards the bottom. It's it's a little bit dark, but uh, so maybe summarizing rather than reading every word. Uh, this mimer has been telling us that the Shrona Esri has a completely different function that we always think of. We think of it as all bodily needs. Please heal us, give us sufficient food, uh, forgive us uh, that we shouldn't be punished, etc. cetera. Uh, silence our enemies who are out there to get us, God forbid. Return our judges to us. We should have proper uh, rabbis uh, like we had the Supreme Court of the Jewish people. All this should return. But the Rebbe has been, this is the previous Rebbe is teaching us that it's really these bakoshos, these requests that we're making in the Shemona Esrei are really all for our neshama. When do we pray for our neshama? We don't even think about ourselves. We think about our body. We love ourselves so much. You get a little scratch there, a little, little uh, scratch over there, a little cut over there. We make a big, big deal about it, etc. An ache, a pain, all bodily things. What about the, the aches and pains of the soul when we have used our body not the way we're really supposed to? So the previous Rebbe has taught us that the bakoshas, the various requests in the Shemona Esrei, are really for our soul for our spiritual well-being, not just for our physical well-being. And therefore, uh, and therefore, we direct ourselves, even these last few uh, uh, Shemona Esrei's that we were citing before Yom Kippur, whether you have the regular weekday Shemona Esrei, we're going to touch upon really what we're supposed to think about. So we spoke about the Kriya Shema, and we're starting the Shema Yisrael, uh, your, your phone is ringing, Dave. Uh, um, just one second until it gets picked up. Uh, the Kriyashma, we said, was a double edged uh, sword. Double edged sword. I'm sorry, double edged sword. And as we said, that that means it's that much more effective. And when we recite it properly, it kills those evil forces. It kills those evil forces that are there, not only to make ourselves do the wrong thing, but all the kind of evil things that are going on in the world and in the country as well. That's a weapon that we have. So the previous Rebbe makes a very interesting comment. He says the even a sword, even a double-edged sword, is as effective as it is. That's only if the enemy who's out to get you is right close to you so you can get at him. Can, is, so you can get it. There's no way to remove that, is there? No. Anyway, no. Okay. That's about later. It. later. Okay. All okay. right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. May Thank I you. pray? Maybe Hashem will help us with that. Mm -hmm. So the double-edged sword is good if the enemy is right close to you. But what if it's a distant enemy? I know you, you're probably saying to yourself, what is he talking about that now? What are we talking about? We're not in the army here, are we? Yes, we are. <laughs> We're very much in the army. The army we're fighting against evil forces, and as they say, they're in the air, and we can get rid of them. Uh, what about an enemy that's far off? Now, today they have guns and bullets, anti aircraft guns, they have artillery, right? All kinds of rockets and all kinds of weapons, etc. etc. What do we do spiritually? So, the previous Rebbe tells us a beautiful thing. What was the word that we used in the Shemona Esrei that we recite three times a day? What was the word that we used for the middle blessings, 12, 13 middle blessings? We called them bakoshos. We called them requests. And if you take the word bakoshos, as you'll see it in the text also in front of you, bakoshos, bekeshes. 
Sometimes you need a bow and an arrow. This means a weapon that can shoot afar. Do we have a weapon that we can shoot afar? The Shema Yisrael is very good uh, when the danger, the evil is close, God forbid, whatever. That's something the previous Rebbe says, when it's something you know that it's wrong, when you know that thinking that is wrong, saying that is wrong, doing that is wrong, that's when the enemy is close. He's close because you realize what's wrong, where the danger is. And therefore, the Shema Yisrael with the double-edged sword is effective there. But what do you do in a situation where we smear over, you know, like you say, have you ever had painted a room or painted something? You paint a room, there's a stain here, there's some uh, a hole over here, there's uh, some black mark there, there's some water damage there. You take the paint can, right, and you smear it all over. Oh, what a nice, lovely room this is. No one would suspect what's under that new coat of paint, right? Well, unfortunately, we do that too. We do that with our misdeeds. We paint them over and we fool ourselves and pretend that there's nothing wrong. So that's where Bakoshos, the middle request of the Shemona Esri, we we'll, uh, may not have time now, but we'll continue it when we can. I have, still have a few more minutes to work with you. That's where bakoshos could be read differently. Instead of requests for our body, just worrying about filling our face, filling our stomach, and protecting ourselves from what seems to be physical harm, bakoshos, here, instead of bakoshos, change the pronunciation to bakoshos. Here was you have to use your bow and arrow. Here's where you have to use another instrument, another weapon, that can go afar. What does far mean? It's far from your taking it seriously. When it's something you take the wrong deed seriously, that's the sword. Double-edged sword of the Shemai Israel is effective against that. But when the evil is far off, not far off physically, not geographically, the evil is fooling you, Doctor, fooling you, right? Fooling you. It's fooling you into thinking that it's really okay. It's really not so bad. And I'm going to give an example very soon. So the the, the previous Rebbe, actually, he translates the Shimona Esrei and applies it to what we're talking about, about the evil that we paint over and pretend that there's nothing wrong. Okay, so I want to give you an example of this in which... I'm going to let you be the judge, okay? You're going to be the judge. You'll be the rabbi and Rebbitsons. Whoever's listening today, I'm going to let you be the judge. I believe I mentioned this in some time in the past, so you forgive me. But every time we repeat something, it's because we can look at it with a new point of view. All right. So here's a situation, okay? This is a typical situation that we could find ourselves in. There's someone who wants to go to a store in the evening. They want to go. This is a favorite store. It has something that they especially like very much. You must have a favorite store, perhaps, perhaps also. Maybe a grocery store. It might be a department store where they have clothes. Maybe they have other things that you enjoy. Maybe it's appliances uh, for the men. It might be tools or it might be something that you happen to enjoy very much. You just like walking around the store and looking at stuff, too. As a matter of fact, even if you're not going to buy, sometimes you like to simply just go and, and take a, a little stroll in the store or a shopping center. You know, you get out of the house for the well, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so here's a situation where this person has a favorite store, as you may as well. And they usually their hours of work don't permit them to usually go to the store because the store is closed at a time when they're often working, so they can't quite make it. Well, they happen to have the day off. Maybe it's a Sunday, maybe it's some other day in which they have the day off. And they could go to the store when it's usually not available to them because they're busy working at their hours. And this is something that they really enjoy. It's a top thing. So think in your mind, 
please transfer this to yourself where there's something that you really enjoy doing, you often cannot do, you don't have the opportunity. Now you got the opportunity. Okay. So what's the problem? The problem is in order to go to the store, when it still will be open, it means instead of going to show for Mircha and Marav and doubling with a minion, you'll have to dubbing at home. Okay, here's the choice. What would you do? So listen to the answer that the person says. You know, I can't go to Mircha and Marv anyway normally because I'm working at that time too. I have to dubbin in my truck or in my car and, and I have to dubbin by myself anyway. It's after the show. By the time I get home, I have to do Marv after the shows have already had their services, etc., etc. So what's so terrible? Watch this carefully. Boy, old kipper. Not just this case. This is the way the certain works. What's so terrible if all the other days I have to dub at home anyway or in the truck or, or at a person's house where I'm servicing, whatever it may happen to be. What's so terrible if I'll skip going to show? This day I could. I'm off. Today I could go to show. Dub with a minion. And believe me, when one dubbins with a minion, there's an enormous difference there. Because the Almighty Shekhinah, his Holy Spirit, is there in the shul. And there are other people there who are encouraging. Just their presence encourages us to direct our thoughts towards the Almighty. People pray together. The souls get together. Souls work together to uh, inspire each other. Normally, I can't go anyway. So what's so terrible if I skip it this time? Okay. Now, this happens to be the week before Yom Kippur. Let's say it's around Hanukkah time, whatever, any time of the year. What would you say? What's your reaction? Please speak up. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of a wrong answer. Don't be afraid of an inappropriate answer. The importance of this class is we all, I've been talk, talk, talking the whole time. Now I'd like you to talk a little bit. What are your feelings? What are your thoughts? Don't be afraid. Now, the person has a point there, right? They have a point that all year on the weekdays for the most part, not Friday night, obviously, they're, they're, they're going to be in show Friday night, but all year, let's say even Sunday through Thursday, or at least Monday through Thursday, they're not able to go to show for Mechamar, especially in the wintertime when they're so early, right? And they have the devil at home yeah. anyway. So what are your thoughts? So I usually have the devil at home anyway. What's so terrible if we do it now also? What do you think? Let, let's hear your thoughts. Anybody? No thoughts. No thoughts? Zero. Zero thoughts? Zero, no thoughts. You, know, you don't have any opinion about what the person should do or not do? I mean, if he's able to go to a minion, you know, it's sort of like, there's, there's an opportunity that people don't, I mean, they, they take for granted and, and, and they should really try to, you know, try to, they should try to make the minion rather than dollar at home. I mean, not, I mean, not necessarily if they're working, but if they have the time, you know, I mean, sometimes they, 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 they have other things that, you know, they're, they, uh, they, maybe they can't make a minion from there uh, mm -hmm. during the work day or something, but mm -hmm. they would come back and, and maybe a or, or something that Thank you. Very good. Any other thoughts? Maybe Rabbi Yaakov, you want to say something too? Oh, okay. I, I agree with uh, Rabbi Fry. Try to make a million. Try yeah. To to yeah. Even uh, if it means, it. even if it means giving up, you know, uh, a rare opportunity. Uh, that's really not critical. It's something you enjoy, by giving up the, the rare opportunity. Ladies can answer too. Mrs. Dickman, are you still on? I'm still on. I agree with what the men have said. You okay. know, fears their domain, but uh, yeah, I, I agree. Well, I'm glad that you do, because we have to apply this to many times. We could do a good thing or the proper thing, 
and uh, it me means skipping it, as we have to skip it sometimes. It's not just mechamara, which is a direct towards the men. There are things for women as well, where I could go and help that friend, you know, or they could shop for that friend as well. But it's going to take me time. It's going to take me out of my way. And uh, there's other times I go out of my way for myself. But this time, because a friend asked, no, I don't really have time for it. You know, so that's, I'm trying to bring up that this question isn't just for men or just for Schultz. And I'm going to tell you what I really wanted to say. As I know you have to go in a second, Mr. Dick, but I'm going to say it quickly. This is what yeah, this is. Yeah, yeah. Are you, are you saying is that sort of like when you're busy with a mitzvah or your, your partner from a mitzvah, in other words, if you have something like, let's say, you know, you're going to help somebody in the assisted living or something like that, and you couldn't do both, and then you didn't have to help a person. No, I, I, I wasn't. No, like, I'm talking about the mitzvahs when there's no, something you want no. to do for yourself. You could do this for yourself, but in order to help the other person, you're going to have to give it up. You could do it another time, or maybe you'll miss it all together. I'm not talking about there's another mitzvah to do. I'm talking about doing for me, myself, and I, or doing for you and yourself. Okay. Let me tell you right now, this is why we say the alchids. Okay. This is a trick. It's a trick and test of the pitchfork guy, as the Rebison calls it. You're being tested, just like Avram was tested by Hashem. I want you to bring up your son. Whoa, that's a real test. That's a huge test. What are you talking about? Go to the store and skip me. What's the big deal? That's exactly what the Sutton, the prosecuting angel, has set up. As you see, he does it very subtly and very quietly. Well, you don't go to Mechamarim normally because you can't and you have a good excuse because you have to make a living and you're not able to go to show. Here you have a chance and you say, well, I don't make it all the other times anyway, so what's so bad if I skip now too? I'm alluding to us. That's why we have the Shemona Esrei. This is a shmir over. Did you hear what I said? The painting over of something that's wrong and finding an excuse by using a nice bright color of paint. All the time I can't go anyway, so now I could. It's not so bad if I don't paint. That's an example of what the Bakeshis, remember we said that the bow and arrow shoots far. When it's something obviously wrong, you know, you're passing by a tray barbecue, of course you turn away. That's the double-edged sword. Of course you turn away from it. You don't even want to smell it. Don't want to look at it, right? But here, when it's something far off, it's not so bad. I don't go usually anyway. That's where you need your bow and arrow. You need your semi-automatic and your automatic rifle. That's where you need your anti-aircraft gun. You need your artillery, rockets, whatever. That's what the Shimon Esri is really about. Now, you never thought of it that way, I'm sure. Neither did I until the previous Rebbe taught us. When we schmear over, when it seems like something is really not so bad or it's okay, and sometimes the, the Sutton fool says, you know, it's a mitzvah to do the wrong thing. Isn't that ridiculous? It's a mitzvah to do the wrong thing. Yeah, you should say it. Yeah, you'll set them straight. Right, yeah. You do a lot of damage, but you'll set them straight. Yeah. You make yourself, you set yourself crooked and make the other person straight. Yeah, like fun. That's what this Maimo is teaching us here. That's where you need a weapon that can travel far. What's the far? Not across the street or across the country. It's far from what one thinks is wrong. You think it's not wrong. You know it really isn't the right thing, but it's not so bad so you smear it over. So that's um, one of the lessons of this Maimo. And we want to wish everybody Maxim Matsova. We have a more class tomorrow evening, unless uh, we all get involved with the Kapars, which is possible. Uh, could happen to me too. Have a wonderful, wonderful, uh, easy fast and and a wonderful new sweet new year, everybody. Rebbe is going to take over now, and thank you very much um, for taking the time today. And I hope that this will make you keep it much more meaningful to you. And the Rebbe has her wonderful way and her wonderful approach. So please listen to her too. Stay on, everybody, okay? 
please stay on if you can. Yeah. You too, Mrs. Dickman. And thank you. And whatever whatever you can do is wonderful. Thank you. Okay. 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 Do you want me to switch the uh, stool? Leave it the way it is? Okay. Okay. Hello, hello, and welcome all. See if your phone is going to uh, hang up everybody yeah, and then we don't okay, need it. Pretty close by. Okay. Can't go too far through. Okay, here we go. With the help of the Almighty, we should have an awesome class. Please, Hashem, you be the teacher and I'll be the Kaylee in which your light flows. And with your help, we are going to all learn a lot about the Torah today. That will help us through the holidays to get the most out of them. So let's begin. Um, let me see. I have a few sections I wanted to share. Yesterday was Shabbos Teshuva, and uh, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And there's a little section I wanted to share here. God willing, I can see with the light I have. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, and so, let's see. Shabbos Teshuva occupies a central role in the experience of the 10 days of repentance, which are called the days of awe. In the following section, we shall elaborate the role of Shabbos, and in particular of this special Shabbos Shuva in the Teshuva process. So it was included in one of the 10 days of awe that is a process of preparing our souls for the receiving of the atonement that is given to us by Almighty God on Yom Kippur. Husband, husband, he disappeared on me. Okay. In order to appreciate the pivotal roles uh, playing by Shabbos, in the process of Teshuvah, let us consider the Torah's description of the first Shabbos. On the seventh day, God completed all his work which he had done and abstained on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Bereshis or, or Genesis chapter 2 verse 2. The Torah here uses two different expressions to describe Hashem's uh, cessation of work cessation, in other words, to stop at the beginning of the first Shabbos. He completed and he abstained. Each of these convey a different aspect of the essence of Almighty God Hashem's rest at the completion of the six days of creation. The word can be understood to connect with the similar word vessel. We are all vessels and kailis of the light of Almighty God, Hashem. And welcome, Carla. Good to see you there uh, on the chat. I just, Hashem told me, look up and look. So I'm looking and I see you. And I'm glad to know you're there. And I hope you walk away from this class with some mega more information that you can apply to your life and have a better quality of life. That's the whole purpose in doing all of this. So let's go on here, and we were talking about the first Shabbos. Then it says here, the diverse elements of the heavens and the earth united together around the common purpose to act as a vessel for fulfilling Hashem's will and manifesting his presence, which, by the way, is a, a good way to realize if we are connected. What does that mean, connected? And what is that of importance as far as spirituality goes? Well, let me explain that. Uh, when we make teshuva, which is to ask God's forgiveness for everything past, present, or future that we have done, we are then um, able to wipe away the slate of anything that we may have that is not beneficial. When we do that, we then uh, can walk with Hashem. Okay, somebody's making noise over there. Please uh, 
Star six is mute for the conference center so that um, we have quiet so people can hear. Anyway, uh, please uh, accept my apology if that was offensive to you in any way. We want to stay clean of any offenses, especially at this time of year, because in order to walk before the Almighty on Yom Kippur and get that atonement that he gives, we must be at peace with all of God's creation as much as possible. So, let's... Uh, Let's see. There we go. So let's go on. Similarly, the word and he rested describes Hashem's rest from all his work. While the word normally denotes physical labor, there we can understand as it's referring to the intermediaries from the word angels or messengers through which Hashem's presence is manifest and the Shekhinah, his divine presence, itself during the first six days. In the course of creation, Hashem's presence had grown in increasingly obscured by his emerging creations. So we know that even the, the spiritual realm has some form of rest. Of course, the world stays going and there are people that observe Shabbos and people that don't. And so there has to be an order to everything in this world. Let's go on here. In Psalms 92, devoted to uh, the Shabbos day, King, the David Amelech or King David sings eloquently of the relationship between Shabbos and Teshuvah and repentance. Teshuvah is repentance. As the first name attests, this is not merely a song of praise, but also the Shabbos is portrayed as a straight chain linking the natural world to its heavenly roots. Surely returning to one's sacred roots is the essence of Shabbos and equally so of Teshuvah. Thus tradition most uh, fittingly relates to the book of Psalms where there's a lot of, by the way, Psalms within the book of Psalms that are excellent as forms of prayer to, pr no, to pray back to Hashem, his own words. Um, there's There are certain Tehillim or Psalms which one can pray back as um, Hi, Carla, I see you there. Baruch Hashem is not the same. What's not the same? Okay. Um, so what I suggest as part of your daily studying of Torah to read through the book of Proverbs and the book of Psalms, not the whole book, of course, but little by little, like leave a marker and come back tomorrow and read a little more. And note down on a paper the ones that are most outstanding. When it comes to the book of Proverbs, memorizing those verses will help you take on what I call a godly mentality. And that is that the scriptures itself says, meditate on the word of God, the Bible, the Torah, day and night. And don't let it part from your lips. And Almighty God will make your ways prosperous. So what he's saying there is if we want to learn and memorize his Torah. And how do we do that? And this is one of the ways. By taking the, uh, the Torah, making at least a whole hour of non-negotiable time for God. So how do you do that? Well, some people can only do six, ten-minute uh, sessions. Some people can do a whole hour at the same time. Some people could do 30 minutes with their coffee in the morning, but then they have to split it up for the rest of the day. Whatever works for you is good. Um, but taking in between learning with others and learning alone, which is Pir Avo says that we should do both, and when you learn alone, you say to Hashem, please, dear God, come and be my teacher. Open my eyes to see great and awesome things in your Torah. So there you are not alone, even though you're alone. Uh, in other words, you're the only human being there, but that Hashem is with you. 
and he will teach you. And women have a special connection called, uh, they call it divine providence, or there's many other, uh, intuition is another one they use. But basically what that is, is that God Almighty, when he created women, he didn't create them from the ground, but he created them from man's rib. And when women were created from man's rib, they were created with extra special uh, sensitivity to spirituality and extra special powers, extra special abilities to learn. And that is because we have the whole house on our plate. And according to the book of Talmud, there is no home without a woman. So a woman is a very necessary part of a home. But a woman can either be a helpmeet or a consuming fire. So what is that? That if a woman studies enough Torah and is committed to using that will that God gave her, free will, for the will of God and only for the will of God, she gets rewarded. And if she has enough energy of the light of the Torah within her, she will have the will to do good and not harm. But those who are seduced by the secular world, which is the first maybe six chapters of the book of Proverbs, talk about the seductive woman. That seductive woman is the secular world. Why? Because it's got all this stuff, even like people that, that drink alcohol too much or that smoke funny stuff or whatever they may do. There you go. Whatever they may do that causes um, them to be seduced into an addiction of some sort because an addiction itself is idolatry. Let me explain. God Hashem gave us free will. Now, that free will has to be used to choose God's will. When we choose God's will, then what we have is reward. Leviticus 23, if you do the will of, of Almighty God to his commandments and his statutes, and then comes 13 verses of blessing. So if we want to learn his will and do his will and force ourselves to do his will and nothing apart from it, it's having inner eyeballs. It's having a auto control of oneself through the divine presence and through the energy and the light of the Torah, which then empowers our good inclination. God forbid that the evil inclination would have the power, which is what happens automatically to those who don't feed their soul with light. For those who don't do what I'm saying, they, the evil automatically comes and deceives and blinds. So it's very important that we stay awake and keep our eyes open, especially making what I call inner eyeballs. The, Re the Rebbe says that we should put on the three garments of the soul, which is thought, speech, and action. What is that? Thought is the battlefield. The mind must be watched at all times. And the only thing that should go on in there are things of joy, happiness, and righteousness. If there's any depression about things of the past or any kind of garbage like that, we need to remove it. If we have trouble removing it, ask Hashem. Please help me, Hashem. Please help me to think righteous thoughts. Reading a little bit of Proverbs and, rep and repeating a few verses daily will also establish, if you, if you think on the word of God, what is the verse I used before? Meditate on the word of God day and night. Don't let it part from your lips, and he will make your ways prosperous. That's a promise from Almighty God. For sure you can stand on it. But the point is that we must do, we have to do, to meditate on the word of God day and night. Then comes thought, speech. Now the mouth shouldn't open unless the mind judged what's going to come out. There is no such thing as reaction. or uh, And that goes into the third thing, which is action, which action is actually emotion. Because somebody could say something to tick off another person, and right away they want to respond. Well, according to the book of Proverbs, uh, retaliation belongs to Hashem, not to us. So then why were we uh, tempted with that sin, which is idolatry, by the way? We were tempted so that we would be tested. 
Now, if we set up ourselves in our minds that if we are tempted or tested with any affliction or offense, and we have to respond in this manner, we think inside ourselves, I forgive that person, I don't care whose fault it is, everything is divine providence, let me just forgive that person. And then we have to think inside ourselves, keep my big mouth shut. Why? Because the rabbi said, if I keep my mouth shut, all my sins are forgiven at that moment. Is it worth what it cost? 100% worth what it cost. Because it's always good to have a clean slate as far as sin is concerned. Not to wait for Yom Kippur. And we should we should make a little notebook called the notebook of, I call it the attitude of gratitude. But basically, um, you write down in there everything you want to pray daily. Like, I'm sorry for any past, present, or future sins. I'm sorry for mine or my children's or my husband's sins as well. I want to thank you for everything past, present, and future. I want to grow spiritually every day. Take me by the hand and let me walk in your will and nothing apart from it. These are things we need to pray. And it's a, it's important when you come to my classes to bring a notebook and a pen so you can write these little things down, which will make such a mega improvement in your life. So let's go on. Now we're talking about thought, speech, and action with the Rebbe of Chabad said that we need to put on as we are going into the beginning stages of the redemption which the redemption will, there will come a time hopefully soon in these days where, um, and it talks about it in Zechariah chapter 14, verse seven, it's called the day of the Lord. And that will be the demarcation line when the resurrection of the dead will take place and the Roman exile will end. And it will be the finalization. If the third war of Gog and Magog will come, that will be the deadline for it. Anyway, um, we do know that those inner eyeballs are super important. They will make a very big difference in the quality of your life. If we are careful with our words. Now on Yom Kippur, we are judged for our words. And so watching them and not letting stuff slip out is even better. I had to sit down with the Almighty years ago when I first made Teshuvah or Repentance. And I said, dear God, from all the movies and all the people around me, there were a lot of uh, flavorful words, let's call them, that I didn't want to say anymore. And I found them to be somewhat embarrassing as well. So I said, okay, what can I do about that, dear God? And here's the answer I received. You cannot remove them, but you can change them. So what was he talking about? Hashem was telling me, that I had to find a word for each word and change it. What does that mean? Oh, hello, Kobe, Borid, Cody. Welcome, welcome. I have a question for your husband. Okay, at the end of class, we'll pull him in. I'm almost done. We're not too long. Let's see what do we got. We got about a half hour left. Hosby, are you here? No, he must have gone up to the shul. We're away from home uh, for the holidays, and we're in Fargo, North Dakota. And um, so there's a shul in this building, and so he's enjoying himself. Or you can answer. Let's try. Give me the question. Anyway, while you're looking it up or writing it, I'm going to go ahead and um, finish what I was saying. God, God help me to remember everything <laughs> or to pick up where I left off. So it's very important that there's certain work that we have to do. It's it, you, you make an action that causes God's reaction. And there are things, you know, a lot of people say, oh, no, let God do this and let God do this for me. I prayed and he'll do. Well, understand this, that if we ask God for anything, we cannot ask him to serve us. We serve him. Scripture says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one, which is I pledge allegiance to the true one and only God. 
But then it says, and I will love him with all my heart and all my soul. And then it says, and I will serve him. So it is a biblical command to serve God. And the first and foremost place we serve almighty God is with our thoughts, our speech, and our action. But then we serve God by being willingly submitting to his will and nothing apart from that. We put up the surrender flag, I call it. The spiritual surrender flag to have no will apart from the Almighty's. And of Roman exile. Yeah, any day now, thank God. Uh, I asked last time in the Targums, which is in the Aramaic version of the Hebrew Bible during the Second Temple period, it says in Genesis. The word of the Lord created man in his image. Okay, let me explain that. We have a piece of almighty God within us. In Hebrew, it's chelak elohim iman, which is a piece of the almighty within us. And we, our spiritual side and our spiritual being within us is what is the likeness to the almighty. Almighty God has various times throughout the scriptures that he calls, like, for example, when he told Moses to go behind the rock and he was going to pass and Moses could see his back and the eyes of Hashem roam across the earth. There are various places in scripture that kind of speaks about parts of a human body. And the reason for that is that there that is the only way that Hashem can give us an idea of what he's trying to convey to us. But the rabbis teach that at no time and anywhere does God ever lower himself to, uh, and to associate his being with a human. Okay. We were born with an evil inclination and a good inclination. And why? So that we have free will to choose good and reject evil. Hopefully that's what we do in order to be rewarded. But if we let it all hang out and sow our wild oats, evil comes automatically. Now, if evil comes automatically, it also comes with what I call a bronco ride or a shaking of the tree, which means that there is no evil that is done for free. And there are some people like the president of the United States right now who thinks he's doing, he's lying to everybody's face. Everybody knows he's lying. And he just stands there with no shame whatsoever, which we call chutzpah, which is written in the Temple Time rabbis wrote that these days, the days before Mashiach ben David comes, that the, the nerve people will have, which is chutzpah, will be above and beyond what we've ever seen. And that's what's going on right now. Let me see what you wrote. I understand what you are saying, but Targum shows that Jews, Second Temple, believed that the word of the Lord was the angel of the Lord speaking to Moshe Rabbeinu. And he was... Just a minute, I got these stupid pest little messages that come up in the corner here. There we go. Now I can see again. That the word of the Lord was the angel of the Lord speaking to Moses, and he was acting on behalf of the Lord. Okay, know that everything that pertains to Hashem or the angel of the Lord is angels. There are good angels and there are evil angels. And everything we choose to do, if we do a mitzvah, which means an obedience unto the Almighty, we create good angels that help us with everything. If we do a defiance to the word of God, which is a sin, God forbid we create an evil angel, which then causes what we call surus or aggravation. So... We kind of have a choice about all that. Now, Rabbi Sprecher, who is an amazing rabbi, you can find him on YouTube, uh, and he has over 500 videos uploaded. He's a mega powerhouse of Torah, and funny, also, he's a comedian. <laughs> but uh, 
the, th the point that I'm trying to bring is he says, turn a sin into a win. What does that mean? That means if a person makes a sin, which is something that is like negative baggage in their account in heaven, when they repent from it, it doesn't just make it obsolete, but it turns it into a merit. It turns it into a win. So he says, turn the sin into the into a win, which means that if we will take whatever we did wrong and ask God's forgiveness for it, it then becomes a merit on our account in heaven, which is a very good thing to have, let me tell you, especially at this time. Uh, hi, Jennifer. Beautiful answer. And so it's very important right now, especially because we're in what's called the 10 days of awe. From Rosh Hashanah, which is the biblical new year, there is only one new year according to the Bible. That's not the Gregorian can calendar in January, but that's part of Roman exile. But what they call the Jewish calendar, which you can find a copy of one and print it on Chabad.org, C-H-A-B-A-D dot org. You can find, type in the search within the site, Jewish calendar, and it will come up and you can print it. It's not the Jewish calendar, which, by the way, Jewish people are a light to the nations because we are the descendants of Abraham and Sarah. We're not a religion. We are the light to the nations, according to scripture. Isaiah 46 or 49 says it. But the point is that the Jewish calendar is the calendar commanded in Exodus 12.1 that God commanded Israel to make a calendar on his holidays. All of the biblical holidays are written in Leviticus chapter 23. And so Rosh Hashanah, which is the head of the year, is there, which was last Monday. Now we are going up and coming this Wednesday will be the 10th day after that. And we are in the 10 days of awe. And then will come what's called Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. That day is a day that if we have already gotten forgiveness from other human beings, and what we do is we walk around telling everybody, listen, if I offended you in any way, I'm sorry. And if you offended me in any way, I forgive you. And that way we're kind of clean. The slate is clean. So we can go into Yom Kippur and all the Jewish people all over the world, if they don't have any me medically reason wrong with them, um, any reason medically to, to not fast, they fast dry, even water, for 24 hours at least from Wednesday at sundown to Thursday at sundown. And that cleans up the, the sin chart completely for the year and gives them a fresh new year to work on. Uh, what else do we want to say about Yom Kippur? That happens about the Orthodox Jewish people all over the world. I believe there are even um, conservative and reformed Jews, which are a less observant level, I think even they fast, if I'm not mistaken. I really don't know what they do. But in any case, um, five days after that, the next holiday listed in Leviticus 23 is called Sukkot. And as I have taught in prior classes, Sukkot is a phenomenal holiday. Why? Because at the end of Zechariah chapter 14, after uh, this, whatever's going to happen, that'll make people's eyes melt in their socket, which he says then of any people that are left from the nations that did not die, they'll have to go up to Jerusalem and celebrate Sukkot with the Jewish people. Now, why Sukkot? Because Sukkot is the holiday where we, as the priesthood of the world, we, the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham and Sarah, are the priesthood of this world and earth. And that's why all those animal sacrifices that were written in the scriptures were given to us to resolve any and all sin in this world. Now, the one that was given for Sukkot for seven days, we sacrificed certain animals in the temple in Jerusalem for the sins of the nations. 
Now, the prophet Hosea, in the last chapter, in the middle of the third verse, he said, let our lips take the place of bulls. Therefore, in all the Jewish siddurim, which are the prayer books, we have all the animal sacrifices that were daily ones and these ones for special holidays so that we would verbalize and read them because by reading them, it's as if they were done with all their laws in the temple. And therefore, we are able to de all the Gentiles in this world, some that know that they're sinning, other that don't, and all that think that a man is God are doing idolatry, oy, oy, oy. May Hashem reveal truth to them soon in these days and forever. And we pray for everybody. We want to see only righteousness in this entire world. Ashkenazis. Versus Sephardic. Not verses, really. They just have different, what's called minhagim. Minhagim are customs in English. So one, like for example, in Passover, the Ashkenaz do not eat rice and beans. The Sephardic do. My mother, thank God, was Sephardic because I, I eat rice and, uh, rice and beans became like one of my main staples. And I learned how to make them phenomenally. They taste yummy. But in any case, they're very healthy. And most of them are non-GMO as well. So it's a safe food. And it's good for bathroom issues. It's got a lot of goodness there. But in any case, uh, getting back to Torah here. Husband, yeah. Yeah. I have a student that asked a question for you. Yeah. It says, he says, let me see if I find all this. It says, come over here and here. I don't want to have to do it two times. It's a lot. Ready? Yeah. In the Targum, which is in the Aramaic version in the Hebrew, but in the Hebrew Bible, during the second temple period, it says in Bereshis, the word of the Lord created man in his image. Then he goes on to say, I understand what you are saying, because I said that the, it's our spiritual side that that is the likeness to Hashem. That's what I answered. But the Targum shows that Jews, Second Temple believers, translated the word of the Lord was the angel of the Lord speaking to Moses, and he was acting on behalf of the Lord. Okay, so that's the whole question he asked, and that is uh, Borid Cody who asked it. Right, the Almighty did come, the creating himself. Come as close right, as the possible. The Almighty did the creating himself, and the image that it means is that God created a special form, a special form for the human being, which has a soul that imitates the creative lights of the Almighty. So that's what it means by the image. And God does all the creating, not an angel. God does the creating himself. He does send angels for various things, but the creation he did himself. So I hope that clarifies that. Maybe right, but, to... but the point that he's bringing also is he wanted to understand, and I explained that very clearly, that it's like an insult to Hashem to say that man is like God or God would be like man or that God, Hashem, would have made himself into a man right. because that's that's we're a lower form and he is of high and above everything and he's perfect, not imperfect as we are. So it would be an insult to God to call him a man in any way. Yes. Okay. That is absolutely true. Okay. Or so. even an angel, even worshiping an angel, uh, anything that God has created that a person selects to be a false god is that tremendous insult to the only. Thank you. So God is God and man is man, and we're very happy to be man, and He's very happy to be God, and so we're all doing fine. And. Uh, we can look up to him, and he's everywhere at the same time, and he answers everybody's prayers at the same time. And if any time you feel distance from God at all, it's because there's something you have to clean up in your life. Um, maybe you have to say, Hashem, Almighty God, 
Holy One of Israel, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, if I did any idolatry whatsoever, I want to ask forgiveness for it now and forever. And let me explain to you that if you use your free will to be a stubborn, hard-headed will and do a will of anything apart from the will of the Almighty, that uh, stubborn self-will, it's called, is idolatry as well. Because when a person rules and reigns over their own life, what they're doing is is they're saying, I like, I will. In other words, they're being a god to their own self. They are their own god. That's not what God gave us free will for. But to take our will that's free and willingly and freely submit it to him. And therefore getting great reward for it. Leviticus 23, from verse 1 through about 13 or 14, God says all the blessings that he will give us for obeying him. Therefore, saying he will greatly reward us for taking our will and only submitting it to his will. And that's the whole test of life. And as you start working on that and do it daily more and more and more, you're going to see a better and better and better quality of life. Such a good quality of life that you could not even imagine exists. I am now about 30-something years down the road, and I wouldn't give it up for nothing in the world, let me tell you. Because it is, I, I talk to Hashem even for a parking at Walmart, and the parking opens. And not just that I get what I want, but that I talk to him all day long. How could I do this? Can I get help with that? It's, I know he's there and I talk to him all day and he answers me all day with everything. Now that is what he created us for, to walk with him. And believe me, there's no better friend you can have in this world. There's no greater love you can have in this world. There is no better quality of life in existence than the quality of life that you get from walking with the Almighty. Amen says, the, um, Carla says, and Baruch Hashem, may everybody be saying that. And we have about 20 minutes left of class. So I want to go back to the book because I saved a bunch of stuff I haven't even got to yet. <laughs> so let's see if we get there on Yom Kippur. Yeah. So it says, let me see if I have anything else here. Oh, clinging to the joy of Yom Kippur. And I've been teaching a lot about joy lately. And knowing that joy is a, a biblical command that it is, we are commanded to have joy. If you look in Psalms 100, it says that we should serve the Almighty with joy. If we go into um, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, it says that the joy of Hashem is our strength. So there we have two commands. Everything biblical is a command, okay? A biblical command, a law. So, unlike what New Testament says, which is not true. So let's read a little here. It is noteworthy that the Talmud in Yoma 81b derives two apparent, apparently distinct um, thoughts from the verse. From evening to evening, says Leviticus 23.32 which implies that one commences the fast of Yom Kippur on the previous eve after that big meal. We're commanded to have like a, like a holiday huge meal before the fast. And if we do that, it's as if we're accredited for an extra day of fasting, which we didn't have to do to have. Firstly, the mitzvah of eating on Erev Yom Kippur, which means the eve or the, at the nightfall of that day, because the day begins when it gets dark out, not the morning when the sun comes up. Why? Because the rabbi said 
that the, the Torah started where it said first there was darkness and then there was light. And so according to the Torah and the rabbis, all holidays start when the sun goes down. So Wednesday at sundown will be the beginning of the fast of Yom Kippur. Let's go on reading here. We're talking about joy. Additionally, there is a requirement that one commences the fast early, not waiting until nightfall. In truth, these seemingly contradictory statements reflect the same theme, that spiritual joy of Yom Kippur. So, and any uh, otherworldly can only be approached through the conduct of Arab Yom Kippur. It is through the rays of Yom Kippur's luminance that eating as well as fasting on Arab Yom Kippur, that they are enabled to approach their holiest of days. And I wanted to say something else that maybe most people don't know, and that is that the way that we choose to do and behave and everything on these 10 days, especially Rosh Hashanah, which just passed, like if we're joyous and happy the whole time, we will be happy the whole year. It will be much easier to be happy. <clears throat> and so it's very important how and what we do. We don't want to sleep late in the morning. We don't want to have any sadness or aggression or anything that we don't want to carry into the year. We want to work very hard to control what goes on, especially in these 10 days. Going on. Defeating the pitchfork guy, the Sutton. And joy is one of the ways of defeating him because it's controlling the mind that helps us uh, have the ability to be joyful. In other words, one of the main things I always teach is you can always choose. Is your cup half empty or half full? Half full means that I'm appreciative for whatever I have, breathing, eating, a roof over my head, food to eat, clothes to wear, and on and on. But having the, seeing a cup half empty is thinking about all that you want and don't have, and then having like, oh, why don't I have that? You know what? You don't have it because God doesn't want you to have it yet. So ask for it and just leave it on his plate. And don't let anything sadden you. No. Let's go on. So the joy of the eve of Yom Kippur is associated not only with atonement of Yom Kippur. Share Teshuva. But especially with the giving of the Torah in the form of the second tablets, which were granted on Yom Kippur. Remember, Moses came down the first ones, and there was an idol worship going on. He threw the tablets down and went back up to get the second set. And he brought the second set of tablets down from Mount Sinai on Yom Kippur. While we generally associate Shavuos, which is the giving of the scriptures to Israel, and it's our wedding anniversary to the Almighty, Shavuos, the holiday of, um, they call it the Feast of, no, it's called, Shavuos is called the Day of Pentecost. While we generally associate Shavuos with the giving of the Torah, tragically the aura of the first Shavuos, because the tablets were thrown down because of the golden calf, so that's why we do it that way. One might assume that the pitchfork guy or the Sutton strove mightily to thwart the giving of the second tablets as he had successfully prevented the transmission of the first ones. But it's an example of many things he can try and tempt, but he cannot do. In other words, uh, if we take our stubborn stiff neck will that God gave us and use it for righteousness and for the sake of righteousness and for the sake of heaven, we will overcome. We will overcome. Anyway, uh, it is also reasonable to assume 
that the maximum efforts of the pitchfork to lure Israel into sinning occur occurred on the eve of Yom Kippur, which was the final day of Moses's 40-day uh, stay on Mount Sinai. So let's drop down a little bit because we only have about 10 minutes, 11 minutes left. I want to get all that I want to show in. Here we go. Let us consider, this is called heavenly waters. Let us consider further the process of purification that the Jewish people experienced every um, eve of Yom Kippur. Close examination of the Mishnah cites above reveals two distinct methods of purification. A uh, mikvah, which are heavenly waters. So if it drizzles or rains any time today and you go out in the rain, the Rebbe said that the rain is like a mikvah, which if we don't have one where we are, that's the second best. Consisting of the waters gathered together through human intervention, um, and that's in Genesis 1.9. And heavenly waters cast upon Israel by Hashem. In the Mishnah, in Ezekiel, or Ezekiel, or Yehaskel in Hebrew, 36.25, chapter 36, verse 25, I will cast upon you pure waters, cast from heaven to earth, clarifies this concept, the divine infusion of purity being showered from heaven to earth, which is that there is a supernatural shower going on during Yom Kippur with a purif purification cleansing. Unlike the mikvah, which is water itself, the waters below, the efforts of mankind to achieve purity, which are far from perfect. These heavenly waters from Yom Kippur represent the, the pristine purity that only Almighty God Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, can provide. This, then, is Almighty God Hashem's gift to the repentant Jew, or non-Jew even, on Yom Kippur, purity. Such unadulterated purity can only be achieved otherwise in the world to come, which someday will be this world, when Mashiach ben David comes. But nonetheless, is bestowed upon all repentant people in the holiday of Yom Kippur. Now there's a little more smidgens here. We have about eight minutes left. Let's read a little further. Yeah, and I'm reading from the book called The Days of Awe for those who would like that book. I got it from Art Scroll. I use it every year at this time. And every year I mark it a little more with notes and everything. Okay. It says on Yom Kippur is an excess is assess is an accessible and repetitive to the ever present C. Yom Kippur is an open-ended opportunity for repentance as open as the ocean's waters. King David, or David Amalek, alludes to the distinction between these two great occasions by proclaiming that Hashem is my light and my salvation. And one of these days soon, we need to do a class on what is what is salvation according to biblical scripture? Because the church uh, misused it. Let's put it that way. Yes, salvation is being saved from all the evil in this world and being rescued from the evil inclination within. But in no way is it by the blood of a human being, which is cannibalism. We'll, we'll go into that one of these days. Anyway, let's go on. In the book of Psalms, chapter 27, verse 1, my light refers to Rosh Hashanah, 
a day in which Israel is subject to judgment along with all of mankind and bask in the, the in Hashem's almighty light, which is a spiritual light of power that empowers human beings to do good and be righteous. Though the Jewish people may be obscured, as Yom Tob's description, that um, among all mankind applies upon all mankind, Almighty God illuminates the darkness and remembers all his people on that day of judgment. Something far more profound occurs on Yom Kippur. Not only is Almighty God my light, but he is also my salvation. Why on Rosh Hashanah? Hashem is my light up to the darkness in which Israel is engulfed in the earth on Yom Kippur. And he saves the heavenly roots, the Jewish people, which are always, which always been firmly implanted in heaven. As the scripture says that Israel is a light to the nations, and that's what I'm doing today and my husband is doing on these videos is to be a light to you all. And, uh, yeah, we got a big light right here behind us, right? Um, because light takes away darkness and light brings joy and removes anything that is not joy. So I wanted to read one or two more quick sections. We have five minutes left. As it is well known in Rosh Hashanah and uh, 16b of Talmud, the righteous are written in the book on, of life on Rosh Hashanah. These, and that's why the Jewish people go around telling each other, may you be written in the book of life forever. These worthy individuals can, and you can still say it, and these worthy individuals can be vindicated on the basis of their own merit. They do not need to be saved. It is the intermediate category. Individuals who are neither totally vicious or totally evil or, or totally righteous who are saved, spared through Hashem's mercies on Yom Kippur. There is a verse recited during Shabbos Mincha that the group's various categories of individuals awaiting Hashem's judgment. And your righteous is like the mighty mountains alludes to the Sadiqim or the righteous people. Your judgment is like the vast deep waters refers to the wicked who will be condemned to, um, to a Bronco ride in accordance with our assertion that is that who require divine salvation. Like I said, what is true salvation? It is being saved from evil, saved from punishment, saved from amounting or acquiring or holding on to sin. Man and beast, you save Hashem. The salvation is the removal of sin. Yes, but it doesn't come from any sacrifice other people make for a person but that the person does it for themselves. And how Hashem gives redemption from sin through atonement on Yom Kippur. But like I said, a person has to do something and then receive from Hashem an action that causes a reaction. You can't just say, oh, Hashem, do this, do this, do this for me. Because when you're saying that, you're asking God to serve you. He doesn't serve you. You serve him. So you say, I'm, I'm doing a keli. Even lighting a candle is a keli. What is a keli? A vessel in which your light can flow through. So we light candles. We may, um, like I say, do your best. He'll do the rest. You have to do what you can do and then ask him to add on what you cannot do. And then it's going to function. That's why a lot of people say, oh, Hashem doesn't answer their prayers. It's because it, you can't be on your, your tuchus lazy waiting for God to serve you. 
You do your best, he'll do the rest. That's how it works. Anyway, let's go on because we're we gotta finish quick. We're almost at the end of the road here. Okay, Rosh Hashanah, strict judgment, Yom Kippur, mercy, implementing justice. The renowned verse, righteousness is Hashem's in all his ways and magnanimous in all his deeds, which is the book of Psalms, chapter 145, verse 17, points out an important distinction between Rosh Hashanah and the occasion on which our fate is determined, and Yom Kippur, when the sentence is actually implemented. So they say that the end of the 10 days, Yom Kippur, is when judgments are sealed. But there's also like when you go to pay your rent on your apartment, and they give you a 10-day grace period to get it in um, before they start charging you an interest. In the same manner, Almighty God gives a grace period. And that is the, the first, I believe it's five days or so, of Sukkot, when you can still get something in the doorway there. Although the official is that Yom Kippur is the sealment the, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the end of the sealing of the judgments for the new coming year what Hashem decrees upon each person for this year. And you can ask Hashem to decree certain things upon you um, at this time. Let's go on. While, Hashem, while Hashem's pronouncement of the verdict is just as are all, the, all his ways, he, he, tamper, no, he tempers the actual implementa implementation of his verdict with mercy and displays on your, that displays on Yom Kippur. As the verse concludes, he is exceedingly generous as far as the actual implementation of the element of, the, of uh, divine mercy. Hashem is far more lenient. His sentence is carried out with mercy. Thank you, Hashem, for your mercy. Unlike mortals who are much easier to influence before a verdict is, is decided, but once the verdict is pronounced and is at the implementation stage, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to change. Hashem's ways or his verdicts are based on strict justice but enforced implemented with mercy the well-known verse and yours Hashem is kindness for your reward each man in accordance with his deeds in the book of Psalms chapter 62 verse 13 and may be interpreted in the same light while Hashem's judgment is based on an evaluation of our merits rewarding everyone according to his deeds. He demonstrates kindness when implementing his verdict. And remember that you can turn those sins into wins with asking forgiveness from Almighty God, recognizing what you did, having a form of um, regret in your heart, and then verbalizing an apology to the Almighty. That's how King David made repentance. Look at Psalm chapter 50 and 51. And that's what he wants from us. Mortals would do well to evaluate Hashem's ways in this regard. And they should uh, strive for the proper intervention in carrying out the ideal, even if the actual implementation falls short of the ideal. And we're almost at the, oh, we're at the end of the road already. And I have one more little smidgen that I'm going to do quickly. I'm going to do a five-minute extra, I guess. Um, when Rosh Hashanah is the day of judgment for all mankind, Yom Kippur's atonement is reserved for all those 
the, the descendants of Abraham and Sarah first and foremost, and all those um, people who turn to only truth. The distinction between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur may be in the covenant. That is emphasized on each occasion. Rosh Hashanah's shofar, symbolizing the voice of Yaakov, please refer to our commentary on the shofar, symbolizes the covenant of the tongue in which Israel improves it, its manner of speech. Remember on Yom Kippur, people are judged for the speech they have used all year long. On Yom Kippur, we stress the covenant of morality. This can be demonstrated by the emphasis placed on the bris milah, which is the circumcision of Abraham, which occurred uh, on Yom Kippur. And women are born already circumcised. And that's what some of the more profound books say. Okay, observance of the ritual of circumcision and the best safeguard of morality is one of the best indicators of Israel's uniqueness. Just as the, the circumcision is uniquely practiced by the Jewish people, uh, so too Yom Kippur is enjoyed solely by Israel enjoyed, but it can, Israel being all those who have turned to the true God. On the other hand, the covenant of the tongue implies only using proper speech, but also the proper use of the sacred. Our tongue becomes sacred when we turn to the true God, the one and only Holy One of Israel, HaKadosh Baruch Hu and could theoretically be shared by all mankind. We have to all be tower houses of light in this world as we go forth. Um, this world has a lot of darkness in these days, and we need to illuminate that darkness. Anyone we can share a little Torah with, any relatives, any neighbors, any friends, Anything we can do to get the Torah out there verbally uh, helps both the other person and ourselves. Um, anything we can do uh, on a personal uh, level of studying of Torah, whether you do it with me here in the class, and to do a little on your own with, with God alone, uh, also brings an illumination in the spiritual realm uh, of light to this, the darkness of this world. And right now there's too much darkness. We really all need to get to work on bringing light back. We have to pray for the repentance of all evil people in this country and that this country go back to having all their laws, only biblical laws, which is what it was. And they started bringing in laws of homosexuality and this and that, which are anti-biblical. And it is a problem because we, if we want God to be over us and over our country, which is what made this country great all these years, then definitely we have to pray for the repentance of especially the leadership of this country and that the new elected people uh, are all biblically based, somewhat level righteous people to lead this country once again and to cleanse the schools of all evil people who are trying to corrupt the children. I couldn't believe my ears when I heard that they were trying to do transgender operations to six-year-olds in the school without the parents' knowledge. Oh, my goodness. So I don't watch television, no, but I have a very select few of people that I listen to news about in order to know what to pray about. Because in these days, we really need to get into, I say, if I prayed on my knees, I'd have calluses. And yes, we pray for everybody that watches our classes and we give tzedakah. And I wanted to tell you that before you go into the fast of Yom Kippur, 
you want to give a few extra dollars of Sadaka to Hashem and say this is for also for the redemption of any and all sin. And so that little bit of Sadaka, which is charity, can also be a mega help for everything heavenly. So uh, with that, I've already gone over time by two minutes. I hope you enjoyed the class. Today is Sunday. Tomorrow is Monday. Tomorrow, New York time. And I say New York time. So there's people from all over the world listening. So calculate your time from New York. Um, and New York time tomorrow, my class will be at 6.30. I think. Um, no. Yes. 6.30? I think. It's either 6.30 or 8.30. So if you go on at 6.30 and don't find me there, then come back at 8.30 and look. 8.30 New York time. We, we're traveling, so we're trying to get all these times and everything calculated. Oh, yo, yo. Or you can call me on the phone. I'd be glad to update you on the time. Anyway, you should have a bracha tzlach of a simcha day. And thank you, Carla, for coming in. You're a great inspiration to my whole being and, and my heart because I work very hard to help everybody. And when I see they're there, that means that we must be doing something. And uh, it's such a nice thing to see that we're fruitful in our efforts. So, and thank you, Kim, for coming in. And thank you, Jennifer, for coming in. And thank you, Hashem, for allowing us to do this and that you are the, the one to get all the glory for the good teaching that we do. And you bless the work of our hands, and that's what gives us the ability. So you thank you, Hashem. And uh, thank you for the class. And thank you for coming in, Jennifer. And so we will be back tomorrow evening. My husband's class is not recorded, but if you'd like to catch a beginner's Talmud class, contact us and we'll give you either the Zoom link or the conference center number, which are the two resources for his class, which will be an hour before mine. Time, I'm not sure what he's doing time-wise tomorrow. Husband, are you there? Yeah. Oh, great. What time is your class tomorrow? Eight o'clock tomorrow night. What? Eight o'clock in the east. Eight o'clock New York eight time? Nine in the east. Okay, so if he's eight o'clock New York time, I would be nine o'clock New York time. Okay, so take it from there, folks. And my class will be recorded for those who sleep early. <laughs> I'm sorry, let me see. Hashem is the only one. I mean, going in the right direction. Now you got it. And it's worth it because every energy that you put in to loving him and serving him and denying self for him will get great rewards for you. And with that, we'll leave you. We bless you. And we hope to see you again tomorrow. In the class, we will be doing preparatory classes for Yom Kippur, which will be sundown Wednesday night. Hope you can make it. Zai Gabench. Shalom, shalom.